First story. Entitled friend tried to steal my brother's house after moving in. Used her people to beat him up. Got him wrongfully arrested and evicted out of his own house. Then ruined his whole life. So I made sure she would get kicked out of the house. End up homeless. And finally die on the streets in the most agonizing way. Several years ago, my brother, Dan, moved from California to Washington State and built a three-bedroom house on one of two parcels of land he had bought when he was 18 years old. He lived in a nice community with a small lake and had an HOA. During the 2008 economic crash, he ran into financial trouble, so we helped him. To repay us for the help, in March of 2016, he came down to California for an extended period to work on our house, which was neglected because of helping him. He was very proficient at renovating houses and did fantastic work. In November, my brother's friend, Jake, called him and asked if a friend of his, Tuna, could stay in one of the rooms for $400 per month. Dan had worked for many years with Jake doing construction for a house flipper. So he trusted Jake's judgment, needed the money, and thought it might be good to have someone trustworthy there to watch his house. Dan drove back up to Washington, cleaned out a room, put a lock on his bedroom door, locked the door, and put some of his things in a storage area up out of the way in the garage. Tuna seemed nice and gave Dan $400 for the first month. There was never a written rental agreement. It was just verbal and meant to be temporary because Dan was going to return in six months. Tuna never sent another payment. We would call and ask her, and she always said it had been sent. But nothing ever arrived. So what was going on at his house? We pieced together that something wrong was going on there after Dan's neighbor called and after questioning Jake. The neighbor complained that the house had turned into a drug house, full of people in cars coming and going all hours of the night. At the beginning of June 2017, Dan drove back to Washington and handed Tuna a three-day eviction notice. She left, stating that she had somewhere else to live and would get her stuff later. He was allowing her to retrieve her stuff at a later date. He just wanted her out. He started working on repairs and cleaning up the house. I mailed Dan a care package with some clothes, a California-themed shopping bag, and gift cards for gas and food. Five days later, Tuna showed up with two men, who punched Dan in the face. They wanted to take the house back by force. Dan went to the neighbor and called the police. The police came, and instead of arresting the men in Tuna, they took Dan to jail for missing a child support court date, which then put a warrant on him. Before coming to California, he thought everything regarding child support back payments for his independent, successful 23-year-old adult child had been taken care of. He had no idea about a court date since they notified by mail, and Tuna had never forwarded his mail, which was one of the things she promised to do. The child support scam on Dan is another issue, I will have to submit later. So, the police essentially handed the house over to Tuna. She and her cronies went in, changed the locks, and placed a long metal bar across the inside of the garage door, so it could not be opened from the outside. They stole the package I sent to Dan and spent the gift cards. Meanwhile, my family and I were on vacation in Hawaii, and I received a phone call from Dan in jail. I spent a whole day of my vacation in the hotel room, trying to figure out how to get him out of jail. Bail bonds could not be used for child support cases. Finally, they let him out when I paid a child support payment of $350. He had been in jail for three days, and the squatters had dug themselves in. So when he returned to his house, he had to call the police to arrest them for trespassing. After all, Tuna had been evicted, left, and no longer had permission to be there. They were squatters by all accounts, but the state defers to people who just claim they are renting therefore requiring a landlord to go through the court system to remove the so-called tenants, who were actually squatters. The police came and screwed him over once again. Tuna claimed she was renting the entire house, and the police believed her instead of Dan. She told the policeman that she would leave in 10 days, and the policeman told Dan that he could have his house back in 10 days, because Tuna said she would leave by then. Are you kidding me? Dan was instructed to leave the premises or be arrested. It was his house. She was trespassing. He got into his minivan and drove away, with nowhere to stay but in his van. Of course, Tuna did not leave after 10 days. Dan went back after 10 days and called the police again. Once again, the police told him to leave or be arrested. We didn't know what to do next. One of the HOA board members, who had some experience managing real estate properties, attempted to help us. She said that he needed a 20-day eviction notice, then Tuna would be out, and this had always worked for her when she had to evict tenants. Okay, so the 20-day notice was posted, and we waited. Tuna did not leave. Dan went over to his house and started cleaning up trash strewn all over the yard, waiting for her to leave. 
Tuna called the police, stating that she was a renter, and he was disturbing her. Once again, Dan was asked to leave or be arrested. This time Dan put his phone on speaker, and I heard the whole interaction between him and the police. Yes, he had to leave or be arrested. Dan could not even get his construction tools out of the garage and could not work without his tools. And with being homeless, how do you even work? What was going to happen to all of his possessions? His sentimental things. His room had been broken into long before. His things removed. And people had used the room. It was near the end of summer. We were paying his mortgage payments. And it was getting so hard on everyone. Then something nice happened. A kind friend, Adam, asked him to stay at his house. Which Dan did. During this time Dan worked for Adam with loan tools. And also went to some landlord-tenant educational meetings. The people at the meetings were helpful and instructed Dan on how to proceed by taking the matter to the court. The police would not go further without a court order to physically evict Tuna. It would be difficult to afford the cost to hire a lawyer. But eventually we did end up getting a lawyer. Dan posted a court appearance on the door of his house, since Tuna never answered the door. And that is what you do legally in this case. Every time he posted a court appearance, he had to legally give her one week notice, which he did. He showed up at court and Tuna failed to show up. So he won by default, right? Wrong. The judge said that Tuna was not given proper notice because the notice was posted by Dan instead of an anonymous person. Dan walked out of the courtroom. The lawyers from the landlord-tenant meetings were there and couldn't believe it. Unfortunately, Adam had to move out of the house he was renting, so Dan had to go back to living in his van. It was autumn in the Pacific and WN getting cold. The police had started harassing him if he slept in his van. We rented motel rooms for Dan. Once, while at a motel, Dan heard a knock on the door in the middle of the night. He thought it was the motel staff and opened the door. Two men burst into the room and proceeded to beat the crap out of him to rob him. They broke his finger and gave him a concussion. Dan ran to his van, drove it to a parking lot, and slept. He refused to go back to the motel. Things were starting to go downhill in a very bad way. I found a lawyer from a non-profit who worked for free to help. He actually used that three-day eviction notice that Dan had given Tuna back in June as a basis for the case. I had found it online, the wording was appropriate, and it had been served properly. The lawyer had to jump through endless hoops and court appearances. The same judge presided over every case that had to do with evictions, and she always favored the tenants, including entitled ones. This took forever, like three more months, and Dan became haggard, homeless, sick, depressed, and at times had gone missing. Once I called every hospital, jail, homeless shelter, and even the food bank, looking for him. His van was impounded four times. He was hospitalized four times. He was endlessly hunted down and harassed by the police. Three times I found him because I was listed as his emergency contact on his state insurance when he showed up at hospitals. While all of this was happening to Dan, my husband was in a serious motorcycle accident, and I had to take care of my husband, changing his dressings, etc. Okay, I'm crying right now. This was so hard to endure, remember, and write about. I couldn't leave and fly up to Washington to help my brother, but I was doing everything down here to get his house back with the lawyer. I got him motel rooms at other motels when I could. I paid four times to get his van out of impound. I sent him cell phones and care packages, delivered at up stores. One time Dan was lost and didn't have his van or phone. He ended up at a hospital who contacted me. He told me that he had felt really sick and had gone to the hospital earlier who released him after examining him, even after he pleaded with them to let him stay because he felt horribly sick. He ended up collapsed on the sidewalk by the Salvation Army shelter, who wouldn't let him in, and another homeless person called 911. So he was back at that hospital with a very serious condition affecting his heart. I told the hospital to please call me at release time so I could arrange a motel for Dan. They didn't. He was then found in a park in frigid weather dressed in a pair of scrubs, a t-shirt, a hoodie, and one shoe. A city policeman called me and took him to a motel, where he stayed a while. I sent a care package there. Dan told me that one time when he was being harassed by the police for cooking food in a park, he mouthed off and told them they were communists, and it was their fault that he was homeless because they gave his house to a squatter. A fire truck arrived, so he was not arrested with the firemen there, but I don't think the police liked him much for saying that. In October, Dan was arrested for drunk driving while he was sleeping in a Walmart parking lot. I had to bail him out of jail over that. Every time he didn't get to court hearings, they would post warrants for his arrest. One time he was in jail, and they refused to give him his medication. So I had to bail him out because he felt so awful. 
In mid-November, the police arrested Dan again for not showing up to court for that so-called drunk driving incident. He begged me to bail him out. Even though the bail bondsman paid the bail in the late afternoon, the jail released him in the middle of the night. Again with no vehicle impounded, a dead cell phone, no charger in the van, no money, etc. I found out later that this jail only releases people at night, so they can get credit and are paid by the state for the whole day. That night he was released. It was our deceased mother's birthday. Dan was then found unconscious in a ditch by a seawall in a Starbucks parking lot. He had a broken femur, broken hip, cracked spine, a head contusion, and that finger was still broken from the motel incident. The doctors evaluated that he had been hit in the back of his head with a blunt object. We do not know who did it. The last thing he remembers was a police car driving by. He was airlifted to a major hospital in Seattle, about 50 miles from where he was. I took a flight up to Seattle as soon as I could and visited him. The doctors showed me the x-rays, and he had countless rods and pins put into his body to put him back together. By this time we were getting closer to having his house back. I went by the house with Adam's brother-in-law, Paul who was packing heat. We pounded on the door, and I demanded that the squatter's hand over my dead mother's rocking chair. The stupid friend, Jake, was there, and he handed it through the door. It is a big heirloom mission-style chair, and they burned into the chair in four inches letters the word, wasted. The court order finally became available, but then we had to schedule the eviction according to when the police had time to do it, which was another two weeks. It was scheduled for the beginning of December. I went back home to California briefly and returned the night of the eviction. Dan was in the hospital for almost two weeks. When he was released, I arranged a nice long-term stay type hotel back near home for him to live at until the police evicted the squatters. Paul helped us a lot. He was with the police at the eviction, changed all the locks, and secured the house. He picked up Dan at the hotel, and Dan got to witness the eviction of that entitled BTCH from hell. She was the only one left in the house. A notice had been posted on the door to warn everyone to leave. But as usual, she didn't think there would be any reason she would have to leave. It took her completely by surprise. The police pounded on the door and demanded she leave immediately. She asked if she could get this and that, but no, she couldn't. She grabbed her little dog, purse, and left with nothing else. The police put a notice on the door after Paul secured everything. Dan was driven back to the hotel, and then I arrived. I wish I could have seen the eviction but I couldn't get a flight early enough. The neighbors said that a bunch of people came to the house that night pounding on the door, trying to get in but couldn't. They almost called the police, but the people left. We went over there every day for about a week to clean up. Dan was confined to a wheelchair and was on heavy medications, so it was hard. He couldn't help too much, but did his best. The house was a disaster. There was literally five tons of garbage in the yards around the house. The trash disposal service was not activated during this time so they just piled it up around the house. On one side of the house was a huge pillar of trash made out of wire fencing. It was about 8 feet by 8 feet and at least 12 feet high. The front yard was awful, with several piles of trash about 4 feet high. Tuna left every single thing in the kitchen, in the cupboards, and rotting food in pans. The carpets were soaked in dog pee. There were clothes and junk everywhere. There was loads of crushed glass embedded into the gravel driveway, like she wanted us to get flat tires. Over the doorway from the house into the garage was a dangerous booby trap, which literally could have killed someone. It was made out of large, heavy metal clamps with a glass jewelry case tethered on top of the clamps. It could have fallen on top of someone's head if not discovered, and someone jarred it a little. The water had been shut off for months by the HO, because they controlled the well and owned the water system. As soon as you don't pay the HO a fees, water is shut off. All the toilets were clogged up with SHT. The sewage system was impossible to unclog, and later DB discovered that they had thrown dirt and plastic containers down the pipes. He had to go under the house and disassemble the pipes to get everything out. Hanging up on the wall in plain sight in the master bedroom was the California shopping bag I had mailed to Dan in the package that Tuna had stolen. She hung it there to taunt me. I am not super religious, but I felt the worst kind of evil there and had to pray and debook the evil spirits from that house. I stayed for weeks there cleaning up and hired some people to do yard cleanouts to get the front yard clean. Later, Dan and Adam dealt with the pillar of trash at the side of the house. Every construction tool that belonged to Dan was stolen. He couldn't work much from a wheelchair, but needed the tools to repair his own house. Dan persisted though. He finally got to the point where he could walk. Now he can't walk for long periods, gets tired easily, but can do things slowly. 
He has some nice roommates that drive him places and take care of him at times. Many of his tools have been replaced. He sanded off the wasted message on mom's rocking chair. We have sunk a lot of money into helping him. But what else is one supposed to do? It was a life or death situation. That was his house he had built so many years ago. This was the most wicked thing I have ever encountered. It was coming from all directions. We heard that the creepy squatter died a year later. No one wanted to take her in, and she went from person to person, staying wherever. If she would have been decent and kind, she probably could have been a roommate and had a place. But she thought she could just take someone's house. Update. Narcissist cousin rips off his cousin and contributes to his own brother's death. I'll call the narcissist cousin Steele, his cousin my brother Dan, and his brother Scout. Steele is deceased at this point. But I guess I still should leave this anonymous. In 2016, Dan came down from W Estate to visit and do repairs on our house in order to pay us back for helping him. He was very proficient at construction and had worked for house flippers. For months Dan worked diligently on our house, repairing eaves, painting it, redoing extensive brickwork, laying a concrete slab, fixing the kitchen tiles, etc. He was really fixing up our house beautifully. Then we found out that our cousin Steele lived close by. I didn't know Steele that well, even though our family was close to that family. We spent a lot of time with the cousins as children and teens, but not a lot of time with them as adults. They kept to themselves a lot, maybe due to skeletons in the closet. At that time, I didn't know much about narcissists and thought cousin Steele was an awesome person. So did my brother Dan. Steele had gotten divorced from his wife, who left him as soon as their youngest child turned 18. That should have been a red flag, but we did not know the details, and he blamed it all on his wife. So now Steele was single and oddly lived in the upstairs offices of a large commercial building, a car wash, in my city. Apparently the owner did not have the upstairs offices rented, and let Steele live there in exchange for favors of some sort. Steele knew a little bit about law, and had helped the owner with some legal matters. The car wash owner was not from the USA, and I do not know his legal status. But in hindsight, it seemed Steele had something on him. Steele visited us and asked Dan if he could hire him to do some repairs at the car wash building. The building had a rat problem, needed the break room fixed per state employment standards, the garage painted and upgraded, landscaping, etc. There was a huge laundry list since this place was in quite a state of disrepair. Dan was eager to be able to earn some money and trusted his cousin. So he borrowed our truck and tools every day and faithfully went to work. Dan is not one for getting paperwork and things in writing. But hey, Cousin Steele can be trusted, right? Wrong. So Dan worked his arse off at this place. It was tons of hard work. He got paid in little dribbles and drabs, never near what was owed. They made up excuses like they didn't have the money and would have it later. Or they would say they would pay after this or that got done. The car wash was super busy so there shouldn't have been any reason to be short of money to pay Dan. Dan noticed the place got even busier after he cleaned it up a bit. They strung Dan along for months. He charged half the going rate, and they had such a good deal, you would think they would just pay him. No, they chose to go down the dark road and knew he didn't have much recourse. We wrote out invoices, listing everything done, and took photos, but it didn't matter. They ignored them. Later on, we found out that our own cousin was calling the shots. Steele was telling lies to the owner and convincing the owner not to pay Dan. Even the labor board wouldn't touch this. Steele had his fingers in all kinds of scams. He even ripped off the labors. He was looking really bad. I decided to search his name on the internet. And wow, he was far more wicked than I ever imagined. There were a bunch of complaints about him listed on a site where you can post complaints. People were claiming to have lost thousands of dollars in their homes because of Steele and the company he worked at. Right after he got divorced, he joined a firm claiming to do home loan modifications. This was when the real estate market went bust after 2008. So I searched for info on the firm he worked at. It went right to the United States Department of Justice website. Several federal cases were listed there for the people who worked at this company who had been arrested, charged with crimes of fraud, and serving time in federal institutions. These people were scamming lawyers, and Steele worked with them. Why wasn't he arrested? And why did he live at a car wash and use his girlfriend's address for mail? Steele was horrible. He even ripped off his own brother, Scout, who was homeless. He had Scout work around the car wash doing landscaping and then did not pay him. At one point early on, Scout worked for us in our yard, and Steele convinced me to give him one woe of Scout's pay, claiming Scout would lose all the money by the next day. Steele said he would give Scout the money over the next week, so Scout wouldn't lose it. 
Steel stole Scout's money we paid to him. Steel constantly made fun of Scout and humiliated him. A few years later, Scout had an argument with Steel and then committed self-harm by throwing himself in front of a train. How completely sad. Then, about a year later, Steel had three heart attacks and died. He was 55. He engaged in a lot of nefarious activities involving drugs and other illegal things. It's weird how karma comes around. Second story. Entitled midwife crossed all lines and kicked me out of the birth room, assuming I abused my wife just because I'm a military guy, causing me to miss my child's birth, not being able to hold my daughter or support my wife. So, I got the midwife fired and revoked her license. Now everyone accusing me of ruining a woman's life. Throw away for anonymity. This also happened a few months ago, but I've recently been told I took things too far. I'm active duty military. My wife and I began trying for a baby about two years after we got married. And after a few months, she got pregnant with our first child. About six weeks after she found out, I was deployed for a six-month stint. Sadly, that meant I would miss all of her ob appointments except the very first one to confirm she was pregnant. Early in her pregnancy, she decided using a midwife would give her a better birth experience. And I was totally on board, because she's the one giving birth, and I wanted her to feel 100% confident in the people assisting. It had also been decided that the people in the room aside from medical staff would be me for obvious reasons and one of our mothers. My mom lives about an hour by car from the base I'm stationed at, while her mom lives a four-hour plane right away. Ideally her mom would be able to get there in time, but she loves my mom too and was okay with her being there if labor went fast and her mom couldn't make it in time. Fast forward to me getting back from the deployment and her being really close to giving birth, like due in a week close. She was supposed to have an ob appointment that I would be able to go to, but ended up going into labor very early on the morning of the appointment. We go to the civilian hospital and they confirm she's in active labor. I called her mom who immediately booked a flight that would have gotten her here at about noon. Then my mom, who came to the hospital a few hours later. A while later, the midwife comes in to see my wife and was rude from the start. My wife told her I was back from deployment, and she calmed down a little but was still clearly not happy I was in the room. Especially once I started cracking jokes to try to distract my wife from the pain of the contractions. Then the midwife glared at me and told me to take this seriously and have respect for my wife while she's in pain. I thought her hostility was weird, but was more focused on my wife and doing all I could to support her. As it got closer to noon, my wife was almost 9 centimeters dilated, and so I decided not to go pick up her mom from the airport and had her take a cab instead, so I wouldn't have to leave for over an hour to drive to the airport. When her mom did get to the hospital, I left the L&D floor briefly to go downstairs and pay the cab driver so her mom wouldn't need to. As the cab is pulling up, I got a call from my mom telling me the ob and midwife were there, and the baby was coming fast. Of course I rushed back up there after tossing some cash to the cab driver, so her mom and I could be there for the birth. When I got back to the L and D floor, my mom was in the waiting room since she had to step out to make the phone call and also knew she would be waiting outside. I used the intercom to ask to be let back in, and to my surprise, I was denied entry. They said they had an order to not let me or anyone in to see my wife. That was really confusing, so I asked why and was just told I wouldn't be let in and not to tie them up on the intercom or security would be called. So the three of us waited outside since my wife didn't answer her phone as she was actively pushing our baby out. Well, over two hours later, she was able to call me back and ask where I had been. I told her the hospital staff wouldn't let me in. But I had been in the waiting room trying to get answers for almost two and a half hours. Long story short, it was the midwife who told the desk staff that I wasn't to be let back in. She lied and said my wife had reported I was abusive, and she didn't want me there. So not only did my poor wife have to give birth alone, and without me or her mom there for support, I missed the birth of my daughter. It meant a lot to me to be there to see my baby come into the world, because I missed so much of the pregnancy, and that was ripped away from me because this awful woman didn't like that I never showed up to a single appointment the entire pregnancy, despite being told by my wife that I was deployed. So, with my wife's support, I filed a formal complaint about the midwife, and she ended up getting fired by the OBS office. My wife is naturally on my side, but some of our friends have said, I was wrong to make such a big deal out of it, and take away the woman's livelihood. Was I the off for reporting her, which caused her to lose her job? I'd like the perspective of people outside the situation. Edit. I took some advice and contacted JAG military lawyers to meet with an attorney about taking further steps. 
I have a meeting scheduled for Monday afternoon to discuss what can and should be done to ensure this doesn't happen to anyone else in the future. Thanks to everyone who offered support. And screw those who DM me to tell me I'm garbage for being in the military and deserve to die because they think I hit my wife. You all have a place saved in hell. Edit two same post. Two days later. Since some people are so caught up on me paying for my mills cap and the jokes I was making with my wife, I'll clear it up. I made jokes because she asked me to distract her from the pain by making her laugh. We were both making jokes, not just me. I also paid for my mills cab because my wife told me to make sure I went down and paid, and also because it was the right thing to do since she didn't choose to take the cab. That was my choice since it was last minute. Relevant comments. Commenter. F that. Anyone says why TA is not your friend family, and they can kick rocks. That midwife was out of line. How dare she? I wish there was some way to give you back those moments. It's so unfair and unnecessary. I don't understand why people need to be so mean. OP. Aside from being mad about my wife, having to go through it all alone, I'm mad that I wasn't the first one to hold my daughter. Our plan was for me to hold her first, then my wife, then whichever grandma won the coin toss. And yeah, the grandmas both decided to leave it up to either a coin toss or paper rock scissors. Lol. Wife and baby now. They're both doing great. My wife had a rough recovery for the first month or so. But the baby was and is perfect. She's nine weeks now, and I'm in love. I can't wait to get home every day and see both of them. Commenter. That SHT could have gotten you court-martialed, no? What the midwife did was malicious and dangerous to you and your family. She deserves to be fired and worse. OP. If it had been a military hospital, I would have been investigated for sure. Nothing would have been found but it would have had career implications for sure. Commenter. It sounds like the jokes set her off. Then she started power tripping. Midwives can act that way. I would file a complaint with the board of nursing and whatever licensing board midwives go through. Have some fun with it. Maybe even get an attorney. One thing we already know is the medical group won't stand behind her. I doubt the hospital will either. Go get her. OP. My wife was laughing at the jokes, so she should have known we were just having fun. We never found out the gender beforehand, so we had a running joke where we both suggested outlandish names for either gender. I had a long list that I would pull from when she had a particularly painful contraction. My wife labored without pain medications, and I think she's amazing for doing that. I would have wanted all the drugs if I were having a baby. Commenter. It sounds like the civilian hospital is in a military community also, so she should be somewhat acquainted with deployments and whatnot. No, NTA. You sound like a good husband who wanted to support his wife. To be denied entry because she had some hard work is disgusting, and she deserved to be fired. I hope you received an apology from the ob. OP. The ob was so apologetic. She assumed I had to leave the room for some reason, and just didn't make it back in time. From the time my wife was determined to be ready to push to, when our daughter was born was only about 15 minutes. My wife is an absolute rock star and pushed for all she was worth, so the baby came quickly. It wasn't until after that the ob learned I was locked out of the unit along with both moms. I don't blame the ob at all. Commenter. That midwife is awful and deserved to be fired. Don't feel bad for a freaking second. She assumed you were abusive and ruined a very delicate, vulnerable, and special moment for all of you. What was her excuse to not let in her mom? Was her mom suddenly abusive too? OP. According to the ob, she implied she thinks all military members abuse their spouses. So she spoke up when my wife wouldn't for herself. But she had no answer for not letting my mill in. I wouldn't have been as upset if at least one of the moms was there. But she made sure no one was, and that hurts me because my wife deserved to be supported. Commenter. Did your wife say anything after it was all over to her? Or anyone, for that matter, from the birth team or hospital before you filed? OP. She said she fell asleep shortly after the birth because she was exhausted. And I totally understand that. Then she woke up about 45 minutes later and asked the nurses if they knew where I was, which is when one of them told her the midwife said no one was to be let in, per my wife's request. She panicked for a minute and asked for her phone on the table, and that's when she saw all my missed calls. Most of the nurses were apologetic and said they had worked with the midwife for a long time and didn't have a reason not to believe her. There is no consensus bot for Ada, but a majority of comments are NTA and encourage OP to seek legal counsel. Update. Six days later. We met with the JAG attorney on Monday, 
and it seems like I have a good case for going after her license, as well as a possible defamation lawsuit. She's a certified nurse midwife, so she has a license that can be revoked or suspended. I'm not convinced it needs to be revoked altogether, but I do think she should be suspended for a while and forced to get more training in her field. The attorney Jag assigned to me is a parent herself, and seemed genuinely appalled that someone would have to miss the birth of their child, because a member of the medical staff used their influence to deny entry back into the maternity wing. Especially when it's for a made-up reason that could have gotten me in a lot of trouble with the Navy. My wife was able to come with me to the meeting, and had a brief conversation alone with the Jag. On the drive home she told me what they spoke about. And basically the attorney just needed to confirm that everything the midwife said about me being abusive was false and unfounded. When my wife told her I have never, and would never lay a hand on her or my child, she asked if my wife felt any sort of emotional distress about me not being there for the birth. She confirmed that she does, and that's when it was decided that we would try to build a case for more than just possible medical malpractice. We don't care about any monetary gain. If we were awarded anything, it would go into an educational account for our daughter or be donated to a charity. We are in agreement that the midwife should have to answer for what she did, though. She took away a once-in-a-lifetime experience for me. Even if we have more children, I'll never get back the lost experience of not seeing my firstborn come into the world. So that's where things stand right now. Any further updates will most likely be a long way off, since there's going to be pending litigation soon. Thank you to almost everyone who commented and offered encouragement. It gave me the push I needed to seek out a legal remedy for the situation. My wife and I are truly thankful. Thank you for watching the video. If you are interested in listening to these kinds of stories, we've got more in store for you. Simply subscribe to our channel, hit the like button, and share it with your friends.